Hello, everybody. Dr. Lonnie Stewart here from the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Are you a physical therapy student about to start studying for the National Physical Therapy Examination? Or maybe you're a professor, a program director, or a clinical instructor who teaches DPT students preparing for the NPTE? Either way, we would recommend checking out our sponsor, NPTE Final Frontier, and the community they've built around preparing for and succeeding on the NPTE. That exam and the preparation that goes along with it can be long, tedious, difficult, and stress-inducing, but it doesn't have to be. NPTE Final Frontier has the tactics and resources to help address all of the usual barriers. They even have scholarships to help with NPTE study courses, FSBPT registration fees, and even research opportunities. And if that's not enough, they're even donating to the very first annual HET Podcast Scholarship to be awarded at the end of every year. Go to NPTEFF.com for all of the details and use code HET for 10% off all purchases. Links to both the NPTE Final Frontier and their scholarship options are available in the show notes. And now, let's get ready to learn. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. F. Scott Field, and I've got with me today two very special guests, one special guest host, somebody who I get to work with very closely, a forefront runner in all things expertise regarding financial literacy, student loans, career development, Dr. Madeline Ritoza, and as always, our specialist in all things student loan repayment and finances, Chris Varela. Guys, thank you so much for, for coming on. Uh, we're just going to kind of do a deep dive today in some of the new student loan repayment options and what it could mean for the future. So Madeline, go ahead and kick us off. What do you got for us? Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I sort of listened to one of the recent podcasts that you had, um, sort of talking about some of the updated changes to the repayment policies. And um, as I was listening to it, I got a bunch of questions and I was like, I and want the opportunity to speak to Chris myself. So um, thank you for giving the opportunity. What I do, I'm not a financial advisor, right? I'm PT faculty, and I, I do financial literacy at the intersection of financial literacy and career planning um, for students. We've done some research on it. And we're basically educating students on how to navigate being a physical therapist while paying down loans and sort of how to access resources in order to meet your own career goals along the way. Um, and so in that, we've sort of educated where the resources are, how to find um, loan repayment calculators, how to look at your options for loan repayment. If you can't make decisions on your own or it's too complicated for whatever your family situation is, that's when I always at, you know, advise students to go to financial advisors, right? When it becomes something that they can't decide or can't navigate on their own. Um, so I would like to get your perspective on sort of how your experience in, in advising clients, that sort of thing has changed given sort of the complexities and more uncertainty that's come about sort of in the last, this really, I think, started with the COVID forbearance, you know, three and a half mm -hmm. years ago, and it's gotten even more complicated in the last few months. To add on top of it, it's it's also been even prior to COVID, this was still a, the same problem that people had, especially if we're talking PTs, right? You're, you're graduating, you have a lot of, of student loan debt, you're making a good income starting out, but it's it, the debt to income ratio is just a little out of whack. And then there were solutions and there still are solutions for that. And then since March of 2020, everything got paused and literally now we're three and a half years later and payments are just starting to resume. So now we have like three years of people that have been putting this off for good reason. Like why, why address it if it's not, if, you're, if you don't need to. Um, so now we have a lot of people that are coming in. They're saying, hey, I've been... Like three years ago, potentially, I was looking at my options, but I haven't looked at anything in three years. And now I feel like the government's dropping a bomb and I have to address this thing. So like, what the heck do I do? So again, that's a big part of what we do for our clients. And it is especially hard for PTs because it's it just it's the debt to income. It's just a very consistent debt to income. We see a lot for PTs, OTs, chiropractors, veterinarians, uh, attorneys, somewhat in the same category, but we all know that attorneys have the opportunity to make buku money so it's a little bit of a different scenario um but yeah i mean I, in terms of how how we generally recommend addressing the student loans and kind of implementing strategy the strategies haven't really changed but how we use each plan within the strategy has changed right because now we have this new plan called the safe plan which just works in a really unique way and it feels like the room for strategy 
is endless. And that's what we're seeing because we're meeting with a lot of new and previous clients just reviewing this plan. And we're just going through all these, all this analysis and we keep finding new things that we can use within this plan that save these clients and these borrowers a, a ton of money. But with that savings of money also introduces a lot of political and legislative risks. So which we'll get into a little bit for there. Now, strategy wise, generally what we always recommend when we're approaching income driven repayment plans is we want to focus on the loan forgiveness aspect, right? Um, but basically the strategy is to focus on minimizing monthly payments and seeking as much forgiveness as you can. And generally speaking, the reason that you want to address it in that way is because whenever you make a payment on the front end of your loan, you're always paying dollar for dollar. So we tell people you're, you're paying 100% of those dollars. So easy example is that if your payment's $100 a month, you're going to pay $100 a month. You're paying 100% of that payment. Whereas on the back end of your loan, you're only responsible for the income tax on what gets forgiven. So what that means is that if we got that same $100 monthly payment forgiven on the back end of your loan at, let's say, a 40% tax rate, you're only responsible for writing a check to the IRS for $40 instead of that $100 monthly payment, right? Which we always tell people that's not just a savings of $60 in this example, but it's a savings of 60%. If we make it a percentage, now it's scalable. So now if you got $100,000 forgiven at 40%, you're only paying $40,000. If you got $200,000 forgiven at 40%, you're paying $80,000, so on and so forth. So what we really take the time to, to educate and help our clients understand is how they could utilize these plans to, again, minimize their monthly payments while also minimizing their total long-term cost by seeking as much loan forgiveness as they can. Because again, you're only paying pennies on the dollar when it gets forgiven. You're only responsible for the income tax that is in that situation. Um, so generally speaking, that's our strategy. So whether we're using the pay as you earn plan, the IBR 2009 plan, uh, repay, or which they're getting rid of and then implementing the safe plan in its place, regardless of the plan that we're using, we want to we wanna approach them in that way, as long as it makes sense. So right, so when, we, when we're talking about debt to income ratio, that's the biggest factor that we look at. Anytime you have double the amount of federal loan debt as you have income, then income driven repayment and loan forgiveness generally is is almost like a no brainer. But from there, it's just understanding what plans you qualify for and, and what your numbers look like, what your tax will projected to be, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of variables to consider, but it's just a matter of meeting with somebody that can organize and and educate all this for you and then present it in a way where it actually makes sense and then meet and then manage it on an annual basis with that person. Yeah. I think that that you bring up a really good point that Madeline kind of touched on earlier. Like we're we're just faculty, right? Had I not met you and and learned from you about the fact that this stuff even existed, I I would not even know where to go, right? So like my my main mission now is at least to bring awareness to this stuff, right? Like I still am not a financial planner, don't know all the ins and outs and details, just like anything else. If I don't know about it, I try to outsource it to somebody who does, right? So yeah, like, what, yeah. what would you recommend for, for, you know, faculty members like Madeline and myself who aren't financial planners, aren't maybe say experts in this, but are at least maybe a little bit more knowledgeable about some of this stuff. Like how do we handle this and bring this to light, to light, to, to, you know, the forefront, to, to bring awareness to it? Yeah. So I think the best thing to do is what we refer to in our industry. It's, it's called like a center of influence. Um, so it's like, allow yourself to be a center of influence, right? So people come to you, they have a problem. You can't be an expert in all things, right? It's, it's, it's almost impossible, right? Um, so it's like, if you're a faculty and people are, are viewing you as a source of information, a source of knowledge and a source of trust, which is probably the biggest thing here. And people go to you and they say, I don't know, what do I do with my student loans? It's like, you have two options. You can, you can try to present yourself as the expert for student loans or finance, or you can say, Hey, you know what? I, I know enough to be dangerous, but like, you need to talk to this person. This is what they do. You need to talk to this company. This is what they do. They can solve your problem. I, I work with them. I know them. I talk to them. I, I'm familiar with how they do. Like I, I, I highly recommend them. So that's usually what I generally recommend. Now, sometimes people don't want to go through a financial planning process, right? Because a lot of people, at least it's just funny with what I do for a living, but like the household I grew up in, is like my, my parents never talked about anything finance. I had no idea how much money my parents made. I had no idea how, what they tried to save, which probably wasn't much. I'm one of five and uh, my dad was an engineer. Mom was a teacher. So I'm sure there was, they were just getting by it a lot of times, right? Um, but they kept everything closed in. And I think that a lot of people still handle their finances that way. And some people are very open about their finances. Some people are very closed off. 
So I think for the people that might be closed off and they're not looking to use a service, use a company, use a financial clear to, to work through their loans, the best thing to get them is just free education on it, right? Or I guess not even necessarily free education, but like, so we, we talk at colleges across the country where we do webinars, seminars, where we talk about this topic and it's very PT specific or veterinarian specific or chiropractor uh, specific, right? So it's industry specific, depending on the audience we're talking to, but that's really the best way to just get the information out so that if people wanted to handle this type of planning on their own, they at least can get a base knowledge of what their options are rather than just going into it from zero, right? So I think that's probably the best next, the, the best thing to do just to get the information, the education in the ears of the people that need it the most, right? So PTs. It's from there, it's more so, hey, look, if you're trying to set this up yourself and if you're getting confused and you're researching all 15 repayment options you have and getting overwhelmed because they all look the same on paper, but they and what they result in terms of short-term and long-term costs is drastically different across the board. So that can get overwhelming. And then that's generally when people say, I need to talk to somebody else here. I need to talk to somebody that 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 specializes in this space. And it's a very niche space. So a lot of times when we meet with people, they're like, I didn't even know this existed. And I always tell them, I'm like, well, it's it does, but there's not a lot of companies that do what we do. It's a very, very niche space. It's very specialized. Kind of going back to before, it's like it, like the, the the traditional way of handling student loan debt, which is just paying it off, that, that's kind of out the window at this point, especially if you're in a PT scenario. You can always pay it down aggressively if you want, but does that make sense? Like what's what's your monthly payments for, to required to do that? What's your total cost to re required when you do that? And then from there, what we recommend is comparing that with a more non-traditional income-driven repayment plan to figure out what are your payments on there or on that plan? Uh, what's your total cost on that plan? What's your tax bill, so on and so forth. And then from there, you can do your own analysis and figure out what is the most cost-efficient thing to do. What's the best relationship between monthly payments and total long-term cost? And what allows me to kind of live my life and pay off my loans at the same time or do one and then do the other. So again, there's a lot of different uh, routes you can choose, but it's really just a matter of, of putting those routes in front of these prospective PTs so that before they have to address their loans, they at least have an idea of what their options are. So I, I heard you say like, oh, the traditional way is kind of out the window. And I think from a, from a dollar per dollar perspective, when you look at a loan calculator, especially if you look at a saved loan calculator with an income subsidy, you're like dollar per dollar, absolutely. I'm going to pay less over time. Um, I paid my loans over seven years and three months, $200,000. Um, didn't make sense for my debt to income ratio. But the the like joy that that brought me is like incomparable. And so I, I've done some research. Yeah. I've done some qualitative work interviewing people that have paid off their loans, a lot of which paid them off very aggressively. And there's this, you know, emotional component. There's this, it's kind of like going through like a war almost, right? Like you you do something for four or five, seven years and it's like this thing was done, right? It's like, it's a very different journey than a 25 year journey. Um, but I do want to come back to this legislative and political risk. So brief story, I graduated in 2015. Public service loan forgiveness was introduced in 2007, right? So it's a 10 year program, 2007. Nobody at the time I graduated had gone through that repayment cycle, right? Nobody had been forgiven because it hadn't been a seven-year window. And so there was a lot of this uncertainty and risk about whether anyone was going to get loans forgiven. And so a lot of people in my generation went into repayment and had nobody that had done it. And then in the next couple of years, people that went to apply were denied, right? And so that's where we see the public service um, loan forgiveness waivers, all this stuff that's come out as a result of this COVID, um, talk about loans, et cetera. So now those people that were denied back in 2017 when they initially went to get approved have been forgiven now, right? But that's been a, a six-year window of this uncertainty of all of these payments ended up not counting and now they count. And that's that's what I consider, and I've never heard this definition until today, but that's what I would consider political and legislative risk, right? You're going into a plan that has a promise of forgiveness at the end of a period, um, but you have to do certain things, right? There's components you have to turn in. Um, you have to have that plan still exist in the future. Um, and so one of the things that my understanding is when they implemented the SAVE program, one of the things that they did is that they said that you couldn't sign up. If you signed up for SAVE now, you can't change to, I might say it wrong, but maybe the pay plan or one of the income contingent plans. 
Um, and that's a precedent where I'm saying an administration, I'm saying you can't sign up for a plan that exists within the rules. Um, and so that sets up a precedent for another administration to come in and say, you know, Biden did it. So I'm going to say that now I'm the new president and I'm going to say that now you can't sign up for save anymore or who knows, like 25 years for graduate repayment on a save plan is a long period of time, right? That's, mm -hmm. I can't do the math very quickly in my head, but that's a lot of administrations and a lot of change. So talk to me about yeah. how, how you advise people and from a financial advisor perspective about political and legislative risk. Yeah, so political uh, and legislative risk and mainly legislative risk or legislative risk is the risk that at any time, any uh, um, presidential administration or government body or entity can come in and make changes to the system, right? So they can make changes to tax law, just the legal system, repayment system, so on and so forth. So that's what legislative risk is. Political risk is, is it's like an offshoot of legislative risk. Again, so the risk is exactly what you said, Madeline, where basically any anybody can come in and they can make changes to the system, which we literally just witnessed, right? The body administration came in, they made changes to public service loan forgiveness. They uh, were fighting for the ten dollars to $20,000 cancellation that got shot down by the Supreme Court. But as a result, the forbearance is now ending. And they were even, even within the past years, they had the power to continue to extend uh, the forbearance. And then they also implemented a new plan. So that is a ton of change, right? So that is a legislative risk. That's change. Now, all the change up to this point has been to benefit the borrower, which I think is a great thing, right? Um, but we have to understand it's like this, this, this risk is always there and that's very high level, but we have to understand also like, why is that risk there? Like why, like what is happening that is creating this risk of change? And you, you have to, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through a little bit of a story so you guys follow this, but you just have to understand like who's losing money in these scenarios, right? So the example I give is, let's say that I want to be a PT, I apply for schools, I get accepted, school I want to go to is $200,000, right? Just flat 200,000. Generally speaking, I don't have $200,000 laying around. So what do I do? I go knock on the door of the government. I take out hopefully federal direct loans through a federal loan servicer. That loan servicer pays $200,000 to the college. Boom, college got paid. They made their money. They charged $200 or $200,000. They got paid $200,000. End of story for them, right? Now the loan servicer through the federal government is now assuming generally, again, this is outside of uh, income driven repayment, et cetera, but they're generally assuming that in good faith, this borrower is going to pay their loan back principal and interest. So the government's going to make their money back and some, right? That's just generally how that cycle is supposed to go. But now we know that there's these income driven repayment plans where you could very feasibly minimize your payments, seek forgiveness, so on and so forth. And it's not uncommon it's actually more uncommon than we, that we don't see this, but it's it's very common that we show PTs that have over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars student loan debt how to pay these loans off with less money than they originally borrowed in the beginning, right? So again, the strategy that we use for that. So I'm not going to go too deep into that now, um, but basically, let's say that because we do this for clients, let's say that because of income and family size, hypothetically speaking, but this does happen in some cases. Let's say that I was able to lock in zero dollar payments on the save plan for twenty five years. I never have to make a monthly payment because of my income level and my family size. My only cost of that loan is my tax bill. On the save plan, you don't accrue interest. So if you're paying $0 a month, you're paying $0 a month for 25 years. At forgiveness, your tax bill will only ever be based off of your original $200,000 balance. So now if we assume a 40% a 40 tax rate again, that's $80,000. I save for $80,000 over the next 25 years. I pay that off. Boom, I'm done. I just paid off $200,000 with $80,000 of my own money, right? So that's great for me, the borrower. That's a very sexy plan, paying my, my loan off with $120,000 less than I originally borrowed. That's great, couldn't be any better. But who's losing money here? The loan servicer, the federal government, right? So I always tell people, if, if, if the, the government does not like to lose money. In fact, they hate to lose money. So when, when we talk about this, again, this is just understanding why this risk is there. The government has two uh, directions that they can go in, in my opinion, and I'm sure there's others. This is just what this is just where my brain's at. They have two things that they could do. One is they could either change the repayment system so that it's not as attractive to the borrower and the government's losing out on less money, or on the flip side, which is I think this is what I've seen that they they seem to be going in the direction of. They could also just increase tax rates across the board for all Americans, right? 
So we already know from the Secure 2.0 Act, tax rates are increasing in 2025. To what exact number? I actually don't know. I haven't seen that number. I'm sure it's out there, but I just haven't seen it. But tax rates are increasing in 2025, right? So it's in a year and a half, two years. So if I'm going to be in a plan for 20 or 25 years, how many other increases in taxes do you think they're going to be, right? I, nobody knows for sure. But again, that's legislative risk. It's, it's what is, what's going on within our system that's going to result in X. It's going to result in them changing a the plan. It's going to result in tax rates increasing, right? So I think going through that story and just helping people understand that, that it's not just that there's risk here, it's why that risk is there. And, it's, it, and it, it gets much big picture because we're talking about a large, a very sophisticated, very intricate financial system. But if we're zeroing in on the student loan stuff, it's just understanding that the government is factually losing money on these plans. So again, with me, it's like, you have to just weigh that risk. If you're not comfortable with that risk, pay it off in the traditional fashion, refinance a private loan, pay it off in 10 years, hit it with the Dave Ramsey hammer, right? Pay it off, right? If you are comfortable with that risk and you're more so, well, I would say even the caveat with the traditional fashion is that it's, it's, it can be very expensive, right? If you're doing, if you have a $200,000 loan and you do a 20 year refinance, your minimum monthly payment is probably, probably going to be over $1,000, close to $1,500 a month, right? That's a large payment to be making for 15 or for 20 years, right? And again, and you pay it off more aggressively, but that's because you're putting even more money into it. So on the flip side, if you're looking to save money, then the income driven repayment plans make sense. But again, you have to just understand that the risk is there and you have to create this mindset of like, I'm going to need to change and adapt potentially every couple of years. Because let's say that, uh, so basically if we were doing a 20 year plan and presidential administrations change every four years, that's five changes, right? If we're looking at 25 years, obviously we're looking at even more, right? We're looking at, uh, we're looking at six changes. You, you have to get yourself in the mindset of, hey, potentially I might need to reevaluate strategy, reevaluate options every four or five years. Do I think that's actually going to happen? I actually don't, but it's, it's possible. So just understanding that is a risk and that could be your reality. You just have to be comfortable with that. And now for a quick shout out to our newest sponsor, Varela Financial. If you're a physical therapist and you have student loan debt, you got to talk to these guys. What makes them unique is that they view financial planning like running hurdles on a track. And for PTs, the first hurdle many of us run into is student loan debt. Varela Financial will help you get over that hurdle. They not only take the time to explain to you which plans you individually qualify for and how those plans work, but they also take the time to show you what your individual case looks like mapped out within each option. So if you're looking for help on your student loan debt or any area of personal finances, we recommend working with them. I use Varela Financial personally, and they were able to help me lower my student loan repayment from about $1,800 a month down to about $135 per month simply by finding the right repayment plan that best fit me, my family, and our life goals. You can check them out at varelafinancial.com. Link is in the show notes if you need it for reference and tell them the HET podcast crew sent you. And now back to the show. I, I like looking at it from like a risk averse standpoint, like at least from an education standpoint, right? I'm never telling anyone to do. I'm telling you what their options are. And it mm -hmm. used to be kind of like you can pay it off on a standard plan, like really quickly, or you could pay it off over long term, but you have a tax bump, right? Yeah. And now it's kind of like those are still true, but the other one may have more risk associated with these political and legislative change it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get your perspective on the um, interest subsidy component. So history lesson again, right? So we know that previously back in the day, you could get subsidized loans for graduate education, right? Then we had the 2008 financial crisis. All states and local governments were hurting for money. They put a budget control act in 2011. One of the things that it did was take out all subsidized loans for graduate education. So starting in 2012, graduate education across the board, every discipline became so much more expensive because you're having to pay interest from the day you start. An interest subsidy coming into the SAVE program is making an unsubsidized loan subsidized in some senses. At the time of graduation, right, you're getting that interest subsidized um, if, you're on, if you're on the SAVE plan. Tell me just your perspective on that. How does that fit from so a bit of risk perspective? So, so are you referring to the fact that you're not accruing any interest on the save plan? So in my understanding is that you pay your monthly payment based on your income, your family's income, however you're, you're filing. Um, and then yeah. whatever unpaid interest, the government basically takes away. Whereas in the yeah. pre plans, they would grow over time. So your tax bump at the end would have been higher. correct. 
So now yeah. we're basically so bas- the government subsidizing those those loans in the terms of interest. Yeah. So I think it kind of goes, it, it kind of feeds off of, of almost what we were saying previously of like, you have this maximum of what your tax bill is going to be, but like when you make a payment, your payment is generally, again, depending on every case is different, but depending on uh, loan amount and payment amount, et cetera. But generally your, your payments are only hitting interest. So what I tell people is with this 0% interest accrual on the save plan, it's, it's a little confusing because people view it. They're like, oh, so it's a 0% interest. And that's, that's not what it is. You still have an interest rate. You're still accruing interest. But then when you make a payment, your payment's only hitting the interest. So I tell people, if you're accruing $500 of interest every month, and then you pay $200, all $200 that you're paying, that's only hitting the interest, but then the remaining $300 that would accrue on top of that, right? That gets thrown out the window. So there's no interest accrual. So pretty much any payment that you make, generally, you're only ever going to be paying off the interest and that forgiveness your tax bill is only going to be based off that principal amount. So kind of feeding off before, the government's not, they're not going to count any accrued interest as as a taxable event. So that's less money that they're making back on these repayment plans. So again, very attractive to the borrower, not very attractive to the federal government because they're making even less money than they would have with the pay as you earn plan where your tax bill is based off of principal and accrued interest. Um, So generally the tax bill would be a lot higher on that plan versus the safe plan. So again, kind of just feeding back into that risk, it's just understanding that this plan, there's just so, there's so much strategy to not have to pay back, even if anything close to what you originally borrowed. There's a lot, it feels like there's an endless strategy to be able to do that, especially if you're talking about potentially being married and having a couple of kids, because the threshold for what would, what would result in a $0 payment is pretty high, right? So I'm married, I have three kids. So if I was on income driven repayment and I was making less than $79,000 a year, I would have a $0 payment. We have plen- plenty of PT clients where their adjusted gross income is under $79,000 and they're married and they have one, two, three, four kids, right? It's, it's not uncommon to see. And as long as they're, again, filing separately if, if from their spouse, if they're in a dual income family, their payment's only ever based off of that. So again, that's how you potentially get a $0 payment and you're not accruing any interest. You still have an interest rate. You're just not accruing interest on top of your original balance. So again, as, if we just overshoot what tax rates are going to be, it's very a lot easier to project out what that tax bill is going to be. But to answer your question, Matt, it's really, my opinion of it is that it's an awesome benefit, but it's just increasing the amount of money that the government is losing out on. So that it also ultimately just comes back to how are they, how is the government going to recoup that money? Because they don't just lose money and say, oh, you know what, whatever, we'll just, we'll figure it out. It's like, they don't do that. Like they do, they actually figure it out and then they make decisions and they make, they make changes within our financial system to recoup that money, which is generally done by increasing taxpayer dollars or increasing tax rates that people are paying more in taxes. I, I, yeah, absolutely. And I think the other party that I don't know has been mentioned is the the private banking industry, right? So we have the SOFIs of the world that made a lot of money on student loan debt by refinancing. Yeah. We've already seen, you know, reactions to some of this stuff and they have influence on political parties, right? So yes. that's something that's another risk, I think, that it's a matter of, of figuring out how much money the system is actually losing these people or these parties, these systems, and then what their what their end result is going to be about that. Yeah. And that's and that's a really important piece. And I hope I'm not cutting you off here, but I wanted to I wanted to introduce another idea of what's going on. So we just so we went through like the cost of the loan, how you can just pay the tax bill, maybe not even make payments, governments losing out of money, right? So if we even go one level deeper even without going to the private loan stuff. Because a private loan refinancing is almost, that's almost the solution to the government, which is just like, well, what if we incentivize borrowers more so to just refinance with a private loan? Because again, the private lenders, so SoFi, they pay the federal government loan off, done. Government made their money, they're done. Just like the school previously, right? School charged $200,000, they got $200,000, they're happy, they're gone. Now the federal government, if if you were to, if I was to refinance $200,000 into a private loan, that private lender, so SoFi, they pay $200,000 to the federal government. Government made their money. They're happy. They're gone. And now I'm locked in to principal and interest payments with, with this private lender. So I've talked about before, and I don't know how the government would do this, but I would say that with everything that's going on, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you see an increase in government and private lending relationships. Uh, because again, the government can make, they will make more money by just having people refinance in comparison to paying their loan off with less than they originally borrowed. But even another thing here too is 
we talk about like all the change in the in the repayment system. It's like, well, why, like, why, why is this such a problem nowadays? It's like it's because people have all this debt, but that's not the core problem. That's a result of the core problem. The core problem is the cost of higher education, right? So with these with these options that we're talking about, where people don't have to pay back all their debt, and the government's paying these institutions off in full, what's what's keeping colleges and universities from saying, you know what, I'm not going to charge two hundred thousand dollars for my program. I'm going to charge $350,000 for my program. I'm getting paid regardless. These borrowers are going to do income driven repayment and just pay a very, like a, basically have like a negative interest rate in terms of what it actually costs to pay their loan off. Like what's going to keep colleges from doing that? And I think that's a scary thing to see. I think that's a scary problem to have exist. And that's even what I was talking to Forbes about months ago where they're like, like, what, like, what's your opinion of all this? And I'm like, I think that all the change is great, but they're not addressing the core problem. It doesn't, no one seems to be addressing the core problem, which is the inflation or the inflated cost of higher education. And do, I don't have solutions, but I would like to see some presented, uh, but they haven't even been targeting that, that aspect, at least from what I've seen. They're only trying to focus on, hey, like what's, how do we fix the result of that problem? Which I don't, I think is only gonna get people so far. I don't think it's gonna solve any I don't think there's going to be any magical fix because again, every year you're just graduating new people over and over every single year into the same situation. I hope that wasn't too much of a wormhole, but, uh, but I, I hopefully, hopefully it was just helpful to understand. But again, it ultimately just comes down to just understanding the, the legislative and political risk that is involved and understanding why that risk is there and, and what could potentially happen as a result of some of the changes that the government's making. I think that's a great point. And if you're listening on the podcast and not the screen, you just, uh, Scott and I were kind of shaking our heads wildly during that discussion of higher education costs. And one of my concerns is that this will truly incentivize programs to become more expensive um, and not see yeah. still an issue. If, if, if graduates can have a 0% payment, why, why is it really a problem that they're graduating with all this debt? Um, and part of that problem mm -hmm. is the political uncertainty, right? Say you have zero pay payments, but in 20 years, they say, oh, we're actually not doing this because of X, Y, and Z. And then they're sitting on $300,000 of loans instead of $150,000 of loans, some you know crisis scenario like that. So I have found like in my work in trying to advocate for financial literacy in PT programs, like even these changes have made it difficult, even more difficult to say that this is important and necessary. Well, especially yes, of over the next couple of years where if they're not going to put the schools in check, they're going to try to cram it in as much as they can and raise that price as much as they can before there's any sort of limitations put on them, you know, or a cap or a ceiling at some point. If they're not getting checked right now, why not go for it? Why not raise the roof on prices and just keep going until somebody says, hey, you can't do that anymore? Yeah, you know? it's kind of like you see that in pharma, right? right? Like the like cost of drugs, like they... I think, and I, I could be wrong, I don't follow the industry that, that closely, but it's like having more strict regulations on, on the cost of medicine, where it's like these pharma companies, these are for-profit institutions. They can charge whatever the heck they want. They're, they're private com or they're, uh, they're public companies, right? They're, they're in charge of whatever they want to do. And there are regulations in place, but there's only so many regulations in regarding to how much they're charging for their drugs. So I think higher education, it's, it's not that different. It's right. Really, and I think that's probably where it needs to go is kind of more fixing like an annual increase of tuition costs. But it's even with where it's at right now is just it's unbelievable, right? It's uh like I feel for it, and I always have I'm always tricky. I don't know I'm always weird of bringing it up because I don't like I don't know what the perception of it when I say this. But I whenever I'm meeting with a PT that has three to four hundred thousand dollars student loan debt to, that they that they take on just to basically be a PT. I just don't understand how that system is in place. I just, I do like, I don't understand it. Obviously we have the solutions for it, but like, I just feel for those, for those individuals because a lot of times they have no idea what they're getting themselves into until it's way too late. Right. Cause they're, they're now the loans are taken out and they have all this debt and they're in college. It's like, oh, I'll figure it out. And if you don't have that financial literacy or that, or that just financial understanding, it's like, you might actually perceive it's like, yeah, I have three hundred thousand dollars of debt, but like I'll, I'll be making good money as a PT, like I'll pay it off no problem. Until you graduate and you look at those numbers and you're like, I have to pay what to have this paid off in ten years? And that's when people, that's where that's that's when the stress just starts hitting you in your chest, right? Um, so again, we have solutions. There, the, the government has implemented these plans. We take these plans, we implement strategy, and it saves people a ton of money. But I, I just still feel for some of these people, and I think the PT field 
from what I've seen as a non PT, not like I don't work in the industry. I just help people. I sell, I help PT solve a problem within the industry, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a big stressor. Um, and I think that's a problem in the industry, which is just the, the, the cost of getting into physical therapy and then also the looming debt to income ratio that's generally across the board. What we see is that PTs very rarely have like a moderate level of debt. They either have no debt because mom and dad paid for it or somebody paid for it, or they have six figures. Um, there's not a ton in between. I would say like yesterday I had two phone calls where somebody, where two individuals had less than a hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. That is uncommon that like that case is, that's not a common case that comes to our doors. Like when I saw that, I was like, are you like, did in their note, did they miss a one in front of all that? Um, cause that's almost generally my expectation. But again, it just, I think also on the front end, some people do a lot of due diligence to figure out what is the cost of all these educations and I could, or all these programs. And I could be wrong here, but I think I've seen that like state programs or state universities. So like if I'm in Pennsylvania and Penn State had a PT program, which I don't think they do, but if they did, I think if, if I went into that program, I could probably graduate with $60,000, $70,000 total for PT school. Whereas if I go to like a private or if I live in Pennsylvania and I go down to Florida somewhere and th that's where I might be taking on 200,000. So it's like the, the, the range there is very different. But I think it's also a competitive market, which I think Scott and I have talked about before. So now it's almost like if you want to be a PT and you apply to schools, you kind of just you go where you get accepted because you're worried that there that there, there might not have space or something like that. Same thing if like you graduate as a PT and they lowball you on salary, but you feel like you have to take it because it's becoming more saturated career, right? Or more saturated market, right? So that's kind of lowering the ceiling. So I think having people, and I think what I've seen is a lot of colleges increasing the uh, amount of financial literacy into their programs is really important because there's a big financial aspect to being a PT because of the student loans. It all kind of trickles back to the student loans, in my opinion. So basically student loans, so debt and fighting for income, right? You, you got you to gotta figure out the best way to handle that debt and you got to fight for the maximum amount of income, which again, with Scott, I know that you do a lot of that. How, how do you utilize this degree to maximize your income and do, do like side businesses, side hustles, et cetera, which I think is great. Uh, but it's, it just creates this balance of what do I do with my loans and how do I maximize my income with this, with this degree? Absolutely. Absolutely. I like at the, at the beginning of that, you mentioned the, you know, the pharma reference. And I think that's absolutely true. Like medical interventions and drugs are, are become more expensive when they become covered by insurance. So it's one mm -hmm. of the weird things that happens because if it's covered by insurance and everyone's going to offer it. Um, and they're going to increase the price for it. So I think the same thing will be for education, right? If it's basically covered in some sense, your your interest over time is going to accumulate less. Um, you're going to have these options for forgiveness where you didn't have before. There's no incentive to reduce the cost. So scary yeah. thing. Um, it, 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 it can be scary. And again, it's just, it's that's why I think it's, uh, I, it feels weird saying this because I'm like the least political person in the world, but it does, like it makes it, it's like when, when president administrations change, it's like really focus on what they're talking about. Like take some of the emotions out of it, which I know can be tricky, but take some of the emotions out and really figure out like, what are these, what are these candidates looking to do within our financial system? Cause that's really a lot of what it boils down to. Like everybody, we, everybody wants the loan cancellation. They want all these different things, but then if that happens and then their paycheck is now less, it's like, like you don't really get one without the other. Um, so it's just understanding how their changes can be made, but yeah, it can very like, I'm always weary of explaining this in a way because I don't want it to sound like it's all doom and gloom because I don't think that it is. I think that there's a lot of positives and there are a lot of potential negatives, but it's just like, it's just, it's, it's not even that they're negatives. They're just unknowns, right? And sometimes something that is an unknown can be very scary. Like, why are kids afraid of the dark? It's like, well, you can't see, you don't know what's there, right? Um, so I think same thing with this. It's like, what can happen in the future? It's like, you can allow that to stress you out or just understand it's like i'm not really in full control other than what what like voting power but other than that i'm not in really i'm not really not in full control i'm just in control of how i react to the situation i'm in full control of that so what we tell our clients is like they just implemented this new safe plan if you look at our calendar we're booked like a month and a half out with a new and previous clients just going through this new plan and seeing if it makes sense and talking through it so when we're having these conversations we're telling them about this risk that we've kind of almost land, not to beat a dead horse, but the legislative political risk here, we're telling them about this and help, telling them that, that they should understand that email that you got from us saying that, hey, this new plan was introduced. We need to sit down and see if it works, makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, we'll talk through it, how to implement it, et cetera, pros, cons, everything. Like if you get an email like that every couple of years, like that's that that shouldn't be a surprise. This is a system that potentially is going to be ever-changing. And 
fortunately for the borrowers, it's like we are here where that is our core business is understanding those changes and understanding how it affects your case. So anytime something gets implemented where it does affect you, we'll be the first ones to reach out and help you understand how you can utilize these benefits to your advantage. Uh, yeah, I love that. I love ending on a, a positive note, right? I think like I, I graduated eight years ago and we had, there were no conversations about this. There were no podcasts about it. There was, it was just figure it out on your own. And so I think one of the, one of the benefits of student loans coming into the mo like modern media and everywhere <laughs> is that people are more open to talking about it. And when you look at, you know, you know, financial success, a lot of it comes with that communication and um, being open. So I, I really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you guys having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chris, where can people reach out to you and find you if they have, uh, you know, follow-up questions or just kind of want to learn more about, you know, how they can navigate these financial uh, student loan debt crisis issues? Uh, where can they find you? Yeah, our best bet is if you just go to our website, it's varellafinancial.com. Uh, there's links all over the website just to schedule a free phone call. Um, so I usually tell people your best bet is just a schedule call. Let's talk human to human. We don't have algorithms. We don't have, uh, it's not a plug and play thing that we do. It's very human to human. It's a very, it's a, it's a financial planning approach. Sign up for a phone call, talk to us human to human. You'll, you'll talk with me. Uh, we'll explain what your options are, what your case could look like. Um, but yeah, go to our website, schedule a call. If you don't want to meet with us cause you don't like me and I'm ugly. Uh, you can always just click through our website and we have a lot of good free information, a lot of videos you can watch, uh, a lot of case studies, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and further than that, uh, we, we put a lot of money into social media. Uh, so feel free to follow us on social media and watch our videos. And again, some are very informative. Some of, our, some of them are very niche within this problem. So like filing taxes separately or jointly with a client or with a spouse, why that's important, so on and so forth. So you can always check us out on social media. We have some good content there, but the best way to just meet with me just go to our website, schedule a free phone call, or uh, tell your college to let us come speak so that uh, we can get your entire graduating class this information on repeat every single year because that's, that's a super important uh, part of this too is really just getting everybody the education in regards to what their options are. Awesome. And Madeline, where can people reach out to you? Should they want to learn more about the financial literacy component or uh, career development? I'm just Madeline Ratosa um, on uh, Instagram or just my website. Awesome. Very simple. We'll put all of those uh, links in the show notes so it's easy for everybody to follow. Guys, thank you so much for taking your time to do this. I hope, uh, again, at the very least, it brings awareness. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks for having us. Well, I hope that episode was entertaining as much as it was informational and educational. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our past episodes, we ask you to please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. And please share out the episodes to those who you feel may be able to benefit from them. We also urge you to follow us on all social media platforms at HET Podcast and let us know what topics or experts you would like to hear from in future episodes. And just as a reminder, none of the information on today's show should be considered medical advice. It's simply infotainment or edutainment to help educate our audience. For medical advice, we always advise you to reach out to your preferred medical professionals, and we'll see you on the next show.